you can run, but you cannot hide. And um, let, let me just kind of uh, backtrack into this message a little bit. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, I was, I was praying right here. And I was just on my knees, and the presence of God was so strong. And I, and I was just weeping in His presence. And I said to the Lord, I said, God, I said, Father, I said, if your presence was in this house, if people could feel your presence like I am right now, if people could feel your glory and your power and your presence right now, I said, this place would be packed. Amen. Hold on before you say amen. <laughs> And the Lord corrected me. And he corrected me, and I was, I was a little shocked. And, and I'm just going to kind of give it to you the way I, I sense the Lord speaking to me about it. And he said I was wrong. And I said, God, that doesn't make sense. And then he started to flood my mind with different scriptures. But he reminded me of the fact that one of the reasons why You would, well, let me say it this way. You would think that when the, wherever the presence of God is, that people would flock to it, that people would just run to it. But sometimes it has the opposite effect, that people flee from God's presence because of conviction, because of sin. People don't want to go to places where they feel challenged or they feel convicted because of their sin. And people often will run from that. So if there's sin in somebody's life, they will often run from God's presence rather than to God. And that's what he reminded me of. And he reminded me that one of the reasons why religious churches are packed is because there's no conviction there. And then some of the smaller churches that are kind of almost bare and empty, yet God is there, it's because the community... Most of the community that are not right with God, that are not living for God, when they do come into a place like this, they feel conviction. They feel dirty. They don't feel right before God. And if they don't yield to repentance, they're not coming back. And I said, Lord, I need scripture for this. And he reminded me of when Moses, when God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, in Exodus 19, and the Bible says that the people came to Moses and said, we're going to stay over here while you go talk to God over there. And he said, you go talk to God for us. We don't need to go. We don't want to talk to God. It's literally what they said. Let me read it to you just real quick. He said in Exodus 19, when the people saw, now God showed up. Now, he showed up in a majestic way with thunder and lightning and the trumpet, and they saw the mountain and smoke, and they trembled with fear. And they stayed at a distance, distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself, and we will listen, but do not have God to speak to us, or we will die. Now, there's God showing up. And Moses said, Don't be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. But the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And then the Lord reminded me in the book of Revelation during the tribulation when the sixth seal was broken. This is what it says. It says the, there were people. It says the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? And, and this is a, a reference from Isaiah 2.19 that says that these people ran from the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. People miss that. They just think, oh, they're running from his terror. No, they were also running from his majesty, from his presence. So the presence of God doesn't always attract. Sometimes people are afraid of it, afraid of him, and they run from him. And then he reminded me of the most classic of all stories. 
in the book of Genesis when Adam hid among the trees of the garden from the presence of the Lord. Let's read that together. Let's, let's take a look at that. Father, we just pray right now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you will just speak to us, God, this morning. Father, we pray that this message, Lord, that, that it will cultivate, Lord, a desire to live for you and to walk with you, but not to run from you, God, not to run in fear from you, not to be afraid of you, God, but to serve you wholeheartedly with hearts of devotion and hearts that are set aright before you, God. Lord, I pray that this message, Lord, will just create within each person here, Father, within the sound of my voice, a desire for more of you, to live for you, and, Father, to want to pursue you like never before. And we ask you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's just read. We're going to read a, about 10 verses. But I'm just going to walk you through this in kind of a little bit of a Bible study format, if that's okay with you. So it says in Genesis 3, 1, now we know the story. God has created the heavens and the earth, and he did this in six days. He rested on the seventh, and he created the man. He put him in the garden, and, and we know that why God did all of this, right? We know that God created humanity, created the, uh, the woman and the man, and he, he did this for one single purpose, for divine fellowship, so that people like you and I could have fellowship with a holy God and so that people could experience his presence, and so that God could have a family. That's why he created us. That was the very purpose. That's why you exist. You exist for a reason, for a purpose. And your main single purpose is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It's to know God. It's to love him and to walk with him. And so everything that God created, he created it for his enjoyment. He created it for, you know, for you and I to be able to experience him. And that was why we were created. And he started with the man and the woman and he put them in the garden. And the enemy didn't like it. Satan didn't like it. So he comes to Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent. And so we read in Genesis 3, verse 1, and he says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. Now let me just stop there just for a second. So what we see here is Satan is challenging God. And that's what he does. He challenges everything that God is doing. And he comes and he says, did God really say? You know, so he questions everything. So he's, the devil is always going to question the word of God. He's always going to have something to say. He's going to tell you that this book is not real. This book is written by man. It was written over, you know, thousands of years by faulty people. And, and it's just, you know, it's just not the word of God. And, you know, it's just, there's, it's full of like myths and all of that. But friends, I have to tell you, this is God's word. This is his book. This is God. God is an author of one book called the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth, so as I like to call it. And this is anointed by the Lord. This, his, these are his very words, and it has the power to change your life. It will reveal his plan for your life, for your future. It will reveal the, what God's going to do in the not-too-distant future for the earth and for creation. And friends, it is the infallible, inerrant word of God. And it would behoove you to read it and to know what's inside of it and to learn and to listen and come to church and hear the word of the Lord preached and taught so you can be a, an effective disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, but the devil is always going to challenge it. He's always going to challenge it. He's always going to say, well, did God really mean that? Did he really say that? And he's going to do that in your life. And he's going to do that and he's not going to stop. And so you've got to be like Jesus. You know, when the devil shows up, you've got to be, it is written, it is written. It is written. That's what Jesus did. That's how he defeated the enemy. And so, and he even challenged Jesus. And in fact, he tried quoting scripture. Well, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from the temple because the Bible says he'll catch you with his angels, right? So he's trying to take things out of context, trying to get him to, you know, to tempt God and, and Jesus, but he responds. And Jesus says, you know, don't tempt the Lord your God. But every time, you know, Jesus comes back with a response from the Word of God. Because the Word of God is stronger than anything the devil can throw your way. It is your defense, friends. You want a shield? You want a sword? It's right here. This is it. 
And I know it might sound like a broken record, but friends, I can tell you it's a whole lot better than depending on yourself or somebody else's word. Amen. Learn to depend on the word of God. It is your sure defense. It is your sure foundation. Amen. Amen? Praise God. So the devil goes on, and, and the, well, the woman now says in verse 3, she says, uh, and she's talking back to the serpent, and she says, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must you not know, touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the enemy does something very unique here. He says to this woman that if you eat from this tree, and by the way, nobody knows if it's an apple or not. You know, we always hold like an apple up. You know, I personally think it was a tomato because I just don't like tomatoes. I just, that's just me. I still think it's a tomato. I don't care if it's a baby tomato. It's a tomato. It's a tomato. I don't like tomatoes, except I do like pizza, which is a kind of a contradiction because it's made with sauce, right? So it doesn't make any sense. I just don't like tomatoes alone. Anyway, we don't know exactly what kind of fruit this was, um, but let's just say it was an apple for argument's sake. And so now he's speaking, the devil, when he speaks, he speaks lies because the Bible says he's the father of lies. Right, But what he does, because he's very clever, he's been around for over 6,000 years over humani within humanity, he's very, very clever. And so he's been around a lot longer than we have, and he knows what pushes our buttons. And so, but he doesn't just give you a lie without giving you a little bit of truth in that lie. That's what cults are. That's what false religions are. There's some truth that might be in them, but they are inherent with lies. And so he comes and he brings this lie mixed with truth. And he says to her that you won't surely die, but your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, the part where he says that you'll be like God, knowing good from evil, was true. Because we also know God later on in that chapter says to, says to you know, to, to themselves, so to speak, the Trinity, if you will. He, he says that, the Bible says that uh, the, the, the man has become like us, knowing good from evil. So it is true. They did know good from evil as a result of partaking of that fruit. However, the lie that was mixed with that is when he said, you will not die. And that was not true. You will die if you eat from that. And that's exactly what happened. And so they didn't die until 900 years later, but they died spiritually first because the Bible teaches that we are spirit, soul, and body. We're spirit being. That's the real you. We possess a soul of which consists of our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a physical body. And so the spirit of the individual died spiritually first. And then over a period of time, because of sin in the earth and the fall of human nature, because of the fall and the curse, it took, it, they lived hundreds of years. It took a while for them to die off. And so then eventually they just died at nine, 800, 900, 900 years. But nonetheless, they died. But the first death was spiritual death. And that's why the Bible says you must be born again. Amen. Because your spirit is dead when you don't know Jesus. And so when you receive Christ as Lord and Savior, the spirit becomes alive. Your spirit, through the Holy Spirit, becomes alive, becomes born again. That's why Jesus said, unless a person is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. And even Nicodemus, he was like, well, what does that mean? Like, how can I be born into the earth if I'm already born now? And Jesus, I'll give you the paraphrase version. You foolish person. You, you're you're, you're a, uh, a Jewish leader, and, and you should know these things. You know, he says you should know them. He says, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about fleshly things. He says, I'm talking about spiritual things. The flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. He says, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again of the spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You must be born again, he says. And if you're not born again, you will perish. That's what Scripture teaches. So getting born again is receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. He comes into your heart. He causes the new birth. He causes you to become born again from the inside out. And that's called the new birth. That's called being born again. That's what the Bible teaches. And so this man dies spiritually, and they die because of the sin and, that's, and then the rest is history and so on. But he mixes truth with lies. So he tells a truth, and, but he also tells a lie. So whenever the enemy tells you something and he whispers in your ear something um, you know, that sounds good, or sound, if, it's not, if it doesn't line up with the scriptures, you can be sure that it's a lie. 
So anything that doesn't line up with Scripture is not a biblical truth. Anything that doesn't line up with the Word of God is on the, in the realm of lies. So if it goes contrary, friends, we're, we're, we're experiencing this now in society. You see a lot of things that are going contrary-wise. They're calling good evil and they're calling evil good. You see it. You know, we have to talk to our children about gender. I mean, friends, it's black and white in the Bible. Man, woman. Man, woman. That's it. Male and female. And that's, but now they have all these different gender identities, twisting up things, and, and so forth and so on. And so it's like you, you have to, you have to if, if you don't stay with the word, you don't stay biblical, you're going to get swept up in this current that's out there. You get swept up into this whole ideology that is contrary to Scripture. It's your choice. You have a choice. You can either believe this book, believe that it's true, or you can believe that it's antiquated and listen to the enemy's lies and get swept up into a whole culture and a whole ideology that is unbiblical. So the, the choice is yours. The choice is ours. So let me go on. This isn't even my message. I didn't mean to go into all of this. So verse, I'm trying to get to verse 8. That's where I, where I, where I want to camp. All right? So when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she also took and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was on the other side of the garden and he ate it. No. The Bible says he was with her. He was right next to her. He wasn't on the other side of the garden. Because if he was on the other side, it would have said something to the effect that she also gave to her husband when he, got, when he came by in a few hours or something. But it says, no, she gave to her husband who was with her. He's watching this whole thing go down. He's got authority to slap that apple out of her hand, that piece of fruit, and say, wait a minute. I'm going to stomp on your head. I'll deal with you later. We'll talk about this later. But he didn't do it. He's watching this whole thing unfold. And the enemy is appealing to three aspects of a, of a human being. When she says it's good for food, she saw that it was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. And she, says that she sees that it's pleasing to the eye. That's the lust of the eyes. This is all 1 John chapter 2. And, he says, oh, and she sees that it's desirable for gaining wisdom or for making one wise, as the old English says. That's the pride of life. That's what 1 John talks about. That the world, and the, and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are the three battlefronts that you will deal with while you're here on this earth. Those three areas. And, that's, and, if, and you see it played out right here. You even see it out in Jesus' temptation. Where he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. He says, you know, if you're the son of God, turn this bread and turn this food into this stone into bread it's it's right there it's all it's all it's all in there so he has nothing new that he comes to you with his tactics are old as day <laughs> i mean they're old but they're nonetheless they are effective if you yield to them and unfortunately we know the story we know what happens and they both yield to this and the Bible says in verse 7 that the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And that to me is a symbol of what we try to do when we have sin in our lives that instead of coming clean, we try to cover ourselves. We, try to, we don't want anybody to know what we did. We try to cover our sin. We try to cover it up. We don't, you know, it's, it's, it, this is man's desperate attempt to fix a problem. You know, sin is now lodged in their hearts. Spiritual death has just happened. Their eyes have been opened. And now they have to deal with the ever, ever forsaken problem with, with sin, if you will, for lack of a better term. And it's not until Jesus comes that this sin problem is actually dealt with and through the cross and through his shed blood. But now watch this. Watch, watch verse, verse 8. This is where I kind of want to camp a little bit. And it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, 
in the cool of the day, and they hid from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And I just want you to just kind of walk with me. Just I want you to just think this through with me just for a second. So the man is and his wife, they hear the sound of the Lord. They hear a sound. And as I was putting this together, I, I couldn't help but to think about the fact that as a believer, as you walk with the Lord, as you serve God, now I'm going to get a little deep, that there will be times where you will hear the sound of the Lord. You will hear, you will hear a holy whisper in your heart if you will listen. You'll hear a whisper in your heart. You'll hear him calling and beckoning you to, to, to an invitation, if you will. And you can, and you can hear him. And, and, God, and, the, and, and Scripture is very clear on this, that God wants you to be able to hear him. He wants you to be able to uh, fellowship with him, but he wants you to hear him. He wants you to, to be in tune with his spirit, to be able to, 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 to... You see, friends, this is not a religious thing. This is a relationship. Amen. That's the difference between us as believers and the world. We have a relationship with the Almighty. And God wants to fellowship with you and me. And he wants to communicate with us. And if we will become sensitive to the things of God, and we will become, and we will learn to develop a hearing ear, we will hear his voice. And you can live your life this way. The Bible says that they that are sons of God are led by the Spirit. They that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Amen. Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice. And God wants you to know his voice. He wants you to hear his heart and hear his voice. And I believe that Adam, he had a relationship with the Lord. You see, Adam, I don't know that he, he saw anything right there, but he heard something walking. Something going on. Mind you, it could have been an animal. He had already, the animals had already been created. It could have been anything. But he hears the sound. And you, because of his relationship with the Lord, he was able to discern, oh, that's God coming. I know that sound. You see, friends, when you're prayed up and you are walking with the Lord, you can get to a place when God begins to show up, you recognize him. You sense him. You, say, you, you hear something like, Oh, wait a minute, you know. And I've, held, I've heard it many times. I've, I've heard the holy whisper of the Almighty say to me, Son, come spend time with me. That's what David said. He said, you said, seek my face. And he said, and my, my heart said, Lord, thy face will I seek. See, the Bible says, I'm getting a little deep here. The Bible says, deep calleth unto deep. God calls into the inner sanctuary of your heart and he beckons you and he says son daughter come spend time with me and so adam he hears the sound he hears it now watch this and he says in verse 8 he says he hears the sound he heard the sound of the lord god watch as he was walking in the garden as he was walking in the garden and when I was putting this together, the Lord just reminded me all the times when I would just go for just these long walks with the Lord, you know. And, and I said, wow, I said, God, you like to go for walks, don't you? <laughs> He's walking in the garden. I have a feeling that this was something that Adam and God may have, had, have done regularly, where God would visit with Adam and they would walk together and they would talk and they would fellowship. We don't know how long this is. You know, the Bible says a, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. It could just be simply seven days. We don't know. It could have been longer. This could have been going on for a long time. We don't really know. But I like to think somehow Adam had this relationship with the Lord. And he's hearing, the, he's hearing God walking in the garden. And I, and I think to myself, you know, what is God doing? Why is he coming down in the form of a, you know, a corporeal being, so to speak, and he's walking? Because he's looking for his man to have fellowship. He's wanting to say, Adam, come on. I want to I I talk to you. <laughs> Let's go for that walk that we used to take. I thought about it. I said, Lord, you know, I have to ask myself, you know, when was the last time you went for a walk with the Lord? When was the last time you went and fellowshiped with him? 
I mean, it doesn't have to be walking, but I just, you know, it could be anything or anywhere that you meet with God. But when was the last time that you met with God? When was the last time that you, that, you know, you, you just, you know, you just decided that, uh, God, I want to just, I want to just talk with you. I just want to fellowship with you. I'm not talking about prayer and petition, because that's good. But I'm talking about fellowship, and there is a difference. When you come before the Lord and you say, Lord, I, I'm not asking you for anything, God. I just want to worship you. I just want to love you. I just want to be with you right now. I just want to hang out with you, Lord. You know, God loves that. I remember many years ago, James Robinson, um, who does the, the feeding for the children and does all those wells all around the world, and he was a pastor, and he, was, um, he had come out, he, he shared this experience where he had went, I don't know, to some, some uh, hello, anybody there? No. So, <laughs> he went somewhere isolated to just get alone with the Lord. And, and he, said, uh, he said to the Lord, he said, God, I'm, I just want to take this time to be with you. And, and, he said he, and he said it was as if the Lord spoke back to his heart and said, James, I'm so glad you're here. And he's like, what? you know, why, Lord? And he said, the Lord said to him, because not many people do. Not many people come and spend time with me. Not many people do this kind of thing. That just, just want to come and, and be with me. And I never forgot that. And I vowed from that day on that I would make sure that my walk with the Lord, that I would always have personal time with him and make sure that I am following him and make sure that I have a time where it's just me and him and we can just have sweet fellowship. And I vowed for that. And, I, and I've, been, I've been striving for that now for 30 years to live my life that way. And you've all heard the story that I, I shared about uh, what's his name. I'm kind of diverging a little bit, but it's, it's related. Uh, where I think forgot his name, something Johnson from Mega Praise Ministries, I think. And he was riding his motorcycle up in the mountains, and he parked his, he parked his uh, motorcycle up there, and, and, he, and he, heard, he heard somebody crying. He said, well, you know, what is this? Somebody's crying. And he's out there at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and nobody's around. And he says, Lord, you know, and then he recognizes that it, it, he has this, this epiphany, this moment, and he recognizes that it's Jesus crying. And he says, Lord, what is it? What's wrong? Why are you crying? And he says that, and he, through the tears, Jesus says to him, he says, my people are not chasing me. They're not chasing me like they should, and like I want them to. And he's almost in tears. And he says, but Lord, he says, I'll chase you. I love you, Lord. I'll follow you. And he said, and at that point, Jesus' tears dried up. And he said, thank you. Thank you. And then to something he said that really touched me. And if you're a bike rider, you'll appreciate this. Jesus said to him, let's go get our bike. I love that. <laughs> I, just, I just, you know, that just, you know. Anyway, there's more to the testimony. But, but you know, let me just ask you, when was the last time that you just said to the Lord, I just want to be with you, Lord. I just want to walk with you. I just want to fellowship with you. And here it says this, as he was walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and they hit, well, in the cool of the day, and by the way, the cool of the day, you've heard me say this before, but the cool of the day, according to many scholars, and this is debated, but the cool of the day was the earliest part of the morning before the sun came out. It was really somewhere probably between 3 and maybe 6 a.m. was considered the cool of the day. And I believe that God was coming at a very early time, as he does with you and I, in the sense that when you, God wants you to be, God, how do I say this? One of the best times to spend with the Lord is in the early morning hours. Now, I can't make that a law. I can't be legalistic about this and say, you have to do it this way because we all have different schedules. I get that. But the reason the cool of the day is the preferred time or the earliest part of your day is because that's when you're freshest. That's when you have the most energy. And so when you give God that first part of your life, that first part of your day, there's just something special and unique about that 
that is not quite the same when you end up spending time with God at the end of your day. Because often at the end of your day, you don't have much energy and you're tired. I mean, come on, let's be real. How many times at the end of the day you say, well, I'm going to read my Bible, and next thing you know, you're like... Or you kept... Or how about this one? You end up reading the same verse over and over and over for like an hour, and you're like, what am I doing? It's like, you know, this isn't working. <laughs> but <laughs> we all have been there, right? But that early morning time, there's something special about that. And I find that when I spend time with God and I give myself to early morning prayer, that everything else that I have to do throughout the day... There's just some kind of grace on it. I can't explain it. There's just something special on the, that God just puts his presence on everything that I've got to do throughout the day. And I get more accomplished when I pray in the morning. I get more accomplished in the day when I give my first part of my day to the Lord than if I don't give that first part of him to, or to him. When I don't spend time with God and then I try to go out and do everything I have to do, everything feels hard. It just feels like, oh, like nothing's working here. It's like, well, maybe we're missing something here in the equation. Maybe we do need to maybe pay a little bit more attention to this. So just a little tidbit. So I, I, I would encourage you, find a time that works for you and that is, that, that don't, what am I trying to say? Don't, don't give God your leftovers. Give him your best. Amen. Give him your best. And that's what we ought to strive to. I mean, friends, isn't God worthy of our best? Amen. Isn't he worthy of it? And look at this, and it says, and they hid from the presence of the Lord. Sin always hides itself. When you have sin in your life, you don't want to do anything with God. It says they, they hid. You know, I'm, I'm kind of telling on myself, but, you know, I've, I've been walking with the Lord for maybe 30 years. And I, I, I know even when I, when I first got saved, I struggled with a lot of things. I struggled with, you know, going out partying, lust drinking, friends that didn't even want to serve God. I struggled with it. I struggled. I mean, I was going to church, and I was still struggling. And if we ended up out with my friends and we partied all night, I sure didn't feel like going to church the next morning. That was the last place I wanted to go because I didn't want my pastor looking in my eyes and seeing sin. <laughs> and I thought he would see it. And he would call me out. No, you, thus saith the Lord. No, and I was petrified. I hide in the back. But, you know, it's human nature. I mean, we're not fooling anybody. Right. We hide. We hide from God. We hide from church. There's, there's, there's you know, things that we do. And it's just, it's, it's just natural for us to do those things. When I was putting this together, I, I, I came across this image. I just want you to see it. I, I thought this was pretty powerful. You know, here, here's a picture of, of Adam and Eve. And they're hiding. I just let, let that sink in for a second. I'm sorry for all the skin, but they're, they're, they, got, they got coverings. But I, I, just, I just thought about that, you know? You know, like God's looking for you. God's, God's after you, man. God's saying, you know, call in your name. Richard. And, and look, look what it says here in verse 8. It says, look at this. It says they hid from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid from among the trees of the garden. And, I, and when I was working on this sermon, I, it was like the Lord just spoke to me and he began to just remind me of the various things that we hide ourselves behind. And he said, some people hide behind their jobs on purpose so that they don't have to give God any of their time. Some people will schedule their whole Sunday to do other things rather than come to church, and they'll do it on purpose to avoid the Lord, to avoid His presence, to avoid any accountability. Well, I have to work. My friends, let me just say this. If you have to work, that's one thing. You do it. You've got to do it. Some people have to work. I get that. You have, you have jobs. You, there's no avoiding that. You've got a schedule. You've got, you got to do it. I, get, I respect that. But I'm talking about those who are purposely making excuses to not give God their best and give them of their, of their time. 
and they will purposely avoid. And I've always said this, if something is really important to you, you'll find time to do it. We all do. Amen. You'll find time. I don't care where it is. I don't care what it is. If it's really important to you, you'll find time for that, one way or another. But I understand there's no condemnation. You know, you have to do what you have to do for your family, your job. You get it? Look, I've been there. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to have to work on a Sunday and I want to come to church. I can't. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to those who actually are running from God and actually intentionally will purposely schedule things in their schedule so they don't have to come to church because they're afraid of some sort. They got sin in their life. And I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to the choir and I'm preaching to those who are supposed to be watching, but I'm gonna, this is being recorded, so I'll get it out later in the week. There are those who hide behind a relationship. I, I have seen this all too frequently. People will get married and then they stop coming to church. I don't know what, what's up with that. I've seen it for the last 30 years, to be honest with you. I've seen single people sit in church for 10 years. They get married and then they're gone. <laughs> and then you find, it's fine if you go into another church. Go. Go somewhere. Get, get fed. Maybe you, the, spout, the other person doesn't like, you know, your church and maybe they want to go. That's fine. But you find out that they're, they're doing other things. I know one couple, they used to schedule Broadway shows on Sunday when they probably maybe should have been in church. That's all I'm saying. Just saying, just saying. But every Sunday was a Broadway show. That was their church. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, <laughs> you know my, my, my pastor, you know, he said something to, uh, well, it's not being recorded. I could always edit this out so nobody would know. But there was a woman that used to come to the, to the Bible study on, uh, like, their Wednesday night. And, uh, but then their schedule had to change. And they ended up, um, you know, not able to attend the Bible study. And it was because the daughter had, I think, ballet lessons on this Wednesday night. Now, I don't want to get into con condemning anybody. Look, we all have schedules, and, you know, I, I get it. My kids are getting bigger. There might be things coming up. Oh, we can't be there. I, I understand. My pastor is very, very bold, um, and he just kind of says it. And so she's telling him, I can't come anymore to, to your Wednesday night services. That's what it was. And, uh, and I don't know if he should have said this, but, but he said to her, well, he said, when the devil shows up, just ask your daughter to do a little dance. <laughs> I mean, that was pretty, pretty brut brutal. But I understand where he was coming from. Because the things that he's sharing and the things that he is bringing to the body are things that will save your life in life and death situations. And when the enemy is showing up and the enemy is wreaking havoc on your family, you are, whatever is inside you is going to come out. You're going to respond however, whatever is being invested in your life when all hell breaks loose in your life, that's how you're going to respond. And I think that's where he was coming from. Like I said, he's very bold. I would never say that to somebody. But I never forgot that story because there's an element of truth in it. Even if it was said in a very, oh my gosh, I don't want to listen to that. But what you give yourself to and what you spend time investing in your life and sowing in your life eventually is going to come up. It's going to come out. And it's going to come out in the worst of times, not just in the best of times. That's why I always say, store up the scriptures for a day when you need them. You know, I was taught from a very, very early period, for 30 years ago, when those doors are open and, there's, and the word is going forth, you, you come and you sit under that word. You sit in that word. You sit under it. There's Bible school, get in it. There's... Bible study, get in it. There's whatever's going on. There's service, get in there. Get to a place, get into an environment where you can be like a sponge and you can develop a hearing ear to the spirit. And when God begins to speak from the pulpit, you begin to, you begin to take that in. You see, when Jeremiah needed a word from the Lord, the Bible says, God told him, go down to the potter's house and I will speak to you there. 
So you get in an environment where you can hear from God, where you shut off all the noise and let God minister to you, let God speak to you. I just, I, sometimes I feel like we got too much wishy-washy Christianity these days. And, you know, and if it's not convenient for us, we're not going to do it. But, you know, there's a price to pay. You know, the, oh, man, I'm getting off. I don't even know what I'm talking about now. So, but, you know, the Bible says that God is a God who hides himself. Do you know that? King James says, thou art surely a God who hideth thyself. It says that it's the glory of God to hide a matter or to conceal a matter. But it's the glory of kings to seek out. It's the honor of kings to seek out a matter. It's the glory of God to hide things, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. Meaning that God, sometimes, he hides these truths so that you have the honor and the pleasure of seeking them out, like opening treasures. And, opening, and there's a joy in doing that. There's a joy in discovering truth. There's a joy in digging into the word and getting revelation saying, oh, that's what you mean, Lord. So God doesn't just freely just hang it out there. He actually conceals it, hoping that you, through the spirit, with, along with the spirit of God, will go and seek these things out, and he will unfold them to you. It's called relationship. That's why the Bible says the natural man doesn't understand the spiritual things. The people without the spirit, the people who don't know God, they don't understand spiritual matters. The world doesn't get it. The Bible says that these things are spiritually discerned. And they're discerned through the spirit of God. But through God's spirit, you get information, you get discernment, you get revelation. That's why God's word will never get old. It's, it's, it's chock full of the Spirit. But it has to be sought. It has to be discovered. That's why the Bible says in the book of Acts that the Bereans were more noble than all the others because they searched out the Scriptures daily. They just were, you know, Bible study, getting into it. Friends, I don't care how much you know, you'll never know all that there is to know about the Lord. Amen. And for all eternity, we'll, for all lives just... Forget about that right now, but let's just say through life. For all the rest of your life, there will always be new things to learn. When you get to the place where you say, well, I already know all that, then you stub your growth. That's just the way it is. Don't lose your hunger for the Lord. Don't lose your hunger for the Word of God. It's like Paul said, who, you know, who hindered you? Who bewitched you? Why did you stop reading the Bible? Why did you stop coming to church? Why did you, why did you stop seeking the, the Lord? Why did you stop? Who bewitched you, he said to the Galatians. Who is it that is hindering you? What is it that is hindering you? How did you lose your hunger? Don't lose your fire. You lose your fire and you're going to lose everything. You're going to lose your walk. Get back on fire with God, friends. Eduardo, can I ask you to come and do a little ministry? And then he says this. I love this, this verse. In verse 9. I, I, you know, and there's other things that people hide behind. Other trees, so to speak, that they hide behind. Not just a job or relationship. There's even some people that hide behind their children. They just want to invest all their life into their children and use that as an excuse to not come to the house of God or not even serve the Lord and say, I have no time. Or even a hobby or an activity. It could be anything. But I love what God says here. It says, but the Lord God called to the man. You see, it's always God first. See, God always beckons you first. You didn't love him. He loved you first. He came to you and me. That's why you got saved. It wasn't because you were all great and all, you know, well, yeah, I, I accepted Jesus as my Lord. Said, yeah, you did do that. But that's because God came to you Amen. and came looking for you and put that in your heart. And he always comes because when we're in sin and our lives are not right with God, we're trapped. But God gives a, a measure of grace, gives you the grace. And it's up to you to respond to that grace. And I love this. 
And I hear a prophetic word in this. He says, where are you? He asked Adam, where are you? And of course, Adam says, he answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. You see, friends, going back to my point earlier, God's presence doesn't always attract. Sometimes people run from his presence. And I was as shocked as you are when I said to the Lord, if this place, if your presence was here, I said, God, this place would be packed. And he said, no, it's not true, son. He says, because my presence is here. And I am in this place. And I'm a breath away from you. And people run from his presence because of sin in their life. They're hiding things. And I think sometimes we run from God because we don't want to face the reality and the truth. But I hear the Lord saying to us today, what are you hiding behind? And where are you? Where are you? Where are you today? Where is your heart? Do you want to serve God? Or is that it? It's, it's our move, friends. It's our move. It's our move. You know, I, I, I got to just say this. You know, and I, I love this. I just got to show you this. Because of sin, Adam and Eve hid among the trees. But because of my sin, Jesus was displayed on a tree. You see, we hid on a tree, but Jesus displayed himself on a tree. You see, so you don't have to hide. You just have to receive what he's done for you. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. I just want you right where you're at if you need to talk to the Lord. If you need to just get anything right with Him, I want you to do that right now where you're at. You know, every now and then, we got to make adjustments. And it's okay. We all have to. We're not perfect. And I just want you to just make that little adjustment in your heart. If there's something in your heart that's just been in the way and I just want you to make that adjustment. I want you to recommit yourself to the Lord right now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Just ask the Lord to forgive you. Say, Lord, please forgive me. Please cleanse me. Please have mercy upon me. I'm sorry, Lord, that I haven't been spending time with you like I want to, but like I should. I ask you to cleanse me. God, I ask you for the grace to pursue you, to chase you, to follow you, to walk with you, to be a, a God chaser and a God seeker. Let that be your heart cry this morning. Friends, if it's not your heart's cry to chase after God, ask God to put the desire in you. Ask, you know, ask him for the desire, to desire him. If you just don't have it, and do it by faith, do it on purpose. Just say, Lord, I, I'm choosing to follow you by faith. I'm choosing to pursue you whether I feel like it or not. I'm gonna live for you, Lord, and I'm gonna serve you, and I'm gonna walk with you, and I'm gonna honor you, and I'm gonna run after you. Even if nobody else does, I'm running after you, Jesus. Let that be your heart's cry. You know, friends, life is so short. It's so short. Eternity is forever. God forbid that you die without knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. God forbid. What is life? 100, 120 years tops? Do you know what that is in comparison to eternity? Look at the sand on the seashore. Your life 
is but a few grains of sand. If each grain of sand was one year, look at your life on earth and look at eternity. It's endless. You don't want to die without Jesus, friends. You don't want to die without knowing him. Imagine that, dying without God, without the Lord Jesus, without knowing him. If you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life right now, I want you to pray this from your heart. Pray with me out loud. Let's all pray this together. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I turn to you. I believe that you died and rose for me. I receive you now, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I live for you, Lord. I will walk with you, Lord. I will serve you, Lord. Be Lord and Savior of my life right now. I believe in you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, amen. Praise God. Give the Lord some praise. Amen. Friends, this message doesn't stop here. Take it home with you. Take it in your car. And just remember this. <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. Eventually, God will find you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. Lift up his countenance.